Hello, everyone, and welcome to China Perspectives, a podcast on economic and credit developments in China, with experts from both within and outside of Fitch. My name is Jeremy Zuck. I'm Fitch's newly appointed lead sovereign analyst for China, and as you may know, I'm joining my colleague Ying Wang to co-host China Perspectives from today onwards. I'm very much looking forward to the candid conversations that we'll have with our guests on this show, and also your feedback and comments. You can find China Perspectives wherever you get your podcasts. Today, on my first show, I'd like to draw your attention to an important topic for China's economic and capital market development, that is ESG. To do so, we'll be discussing Sustainable Fitch's recent semi-annual China ESG snapshot report, which did a deep dive on recent developments in China's rapidly growing onshore green bond market and the impact of global carbon policies on China's domestic emissions trading scheme. We are privileged to have the author of that report, Jingwei Jia, from Sustainable Fitch, with us to discuss some of these recent developments in the ESG space in China. Jingwei is an associate director at Sustainable Fitch on the ESG research team. She has spent four years at Fitch researching ESG topics across the APAC region, with a particular focus on China, and digging into a number of critical and quickly evolving issues such as green bonds and carbon markets. Welcome, Jingwei. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Jeremy. Very happy to be here today. Now, Jingwei, before we jump into discussing the topic at hand, I realize a number of our listeners may not fully be aware of Sustainable Fitch. Could you give us a bit of background on Sustainable Fitch and the activities that it is involved in? Absolutely. So, Sustainable Fitch is a newly established business unit. Under Fitch Group, that provides insights, tools, and data to the ESG financial community. It recently became separated from the Fitch ratings in 2021, as we intend to offer a new holistic suite of analytical tools to assess the quality of the financial instruments and the companies or issuers, with a special focus on the impact and performance of these bonds and loans. So this is very different from the credit ratings. What we're doing here includes the ESG ratings, ESG scores,、um, transition assessment,、um, second-party opinions, as well as the ESG research, which is where I'm sitting at.、Um, so it's definitely my great pleasure to be here today and share some of the very recent news on China market. Thanks, Jingwei. Sounds certainly like Sustainable Fitch is doing a lot of interesting and very important work. Now. Turning to, of course, the issue at hand today, I guess we could start with a discussion on China's green bond market. As the report highlights, you know, this bond market has been developing quite quickly since its initial sort of emergence several years ago.、Uh, so, to set the scene for our listeners, could you maybe briefly introduce the current state of China's green bond market and share how you see its outlook? Of course. So green bonds in China officially began from around 2015, 2016, when the policymakers started to use it as a policy tool to promote domestic green finance. The first issuance was from a Chinese renewable energy company、um, that came to the market in 2015 that issued a green bond with an amount of 30 million U.S. dollars. And the size and volume of the green bonds issued by Chinese issuers in the past few years have expanded quite astonishingly, and especially starting from 2020. Got to see that the government announced、um, its climate targets to achieve the carbon peak by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2060. China has now become the largest source of green bonds as of 2022. So, according to data from Climate Bond Initiative, at the same time, there has also been a lot of innovation coming into the labor bond market over the years. In addition to green bonds, such as social bonds, sustainability bonds, sustainability linked bonds, and、uh, transition bonds. In our analysis at a sustainable Fitch, we're separating the analysis for the domestic onshore green bonds, where the issuers are raising capital in the domestic market, from the offshore green bonds,、um, because they are actually a subject to the different regulations, standards, investor bases, and practices. Our ESG research team at Sustainable Fitch 
has been tracking the development of China green bond market quite closely in the past few years. Uh, we also publish research on this topic regularly. And in one of the most recent research from July, we found that the green bonds are continuing to dominate China's labor bond market in 2023 so far. So the onshore green bond issuance, excluding special bonds from local governments, have reached 700 billion Chinese yuan in the first three quarters of 2023. And this is equivalent to the 80% of all the green bonds issued in 2022, uh, largely benefiting from a relatively lower domestic interest rates and a strong government support. We expect to see that the overall issuance in 2023 uh, will either stay at the same level or exceed the 2023 overall amount. At this point, financials, so this is mostly banks, um, utilities, energy companies, industrials, continue to make up the vast majority of the onshore green bond due to the government policies to scale up the domestic green finance. There are also special bonds that have been issued by the Chinese local governments to finance large green and environmental infrastructure projects. Some of the common ones we have seen so far are the low carbon transportation, agriculture and hydraulics for flood and drought control and clean energy. So if we're just looking at the green bond database, sometimes um, the special bonds probably also going to be included as part of analysis for the to describe the scales of green bond market. But in our analysis, we're actually removing this part from the overall analysis just to make a note that the special bonds coming from local government are actually very different from the typical labor bonds because they do not follow a domestic or international green bond framework or taxonomy, even if the proceeds are largely tied to the green and environmental activity. The priorities from the special bonds are, um, is mostly to use an expansionary physical policy to develop the low carbon environmental infrastructure. Another point that I want to make here is that the onshore green bonds tend to have a shorter maturities, so which is normally three to five years, and it's largely due to the uh, relatively lower interest rates on the market. But short term borrowing can actually expose the issuers to a greater cash management risks um, because the bond proceeds are normally used to fund the long-term large-scale green projects such as renewable energy, infrastructure, and the green buildings. But on the other hand, we're also seeing nearly 60% of the green bonds issued in 2022 will mature in less than three years. So this is indicating a greater market potential for the future issuances. So as you've highlighted, there's certainly a wide range of green instruments that have come into the market uh, recently. I'm just wondering in terms of market interest and performance, you know, how well received are these green bonds by the market? And when it comes to green bonds, there's often discussion of a a so-called greenium. Are we seeing greenium in the Chinese market as we do in other markets around the world? Uh, that's definitely a very interesting question, and uh, we've been seeing a lot of recent debates around coming from the Chinese domestic and international investors on this topic. In our research, uh, we have definitely observed an absence of greenium in China's onshore green bond market, and we found that the Chinese onshore green bonds have shown um, pricing discounts and higher yields against non-green bonds. So this is in contrast to the greenium that has been seen in developed markets like Europe, where investors, they need to pay higher prices to accept the lower yields um, in exchange for a sustainable impact. Uh, one reason to explain the absence of greenium in China is uh, probably the lower demand and the willingness to purchase green assets in the onshore market. The supply of onshore green bonds have increased rapidly, driven by China's carbon neutrality targets. However, the demand for green bonds remains moderate as a domestic investors other than policy banks, so such as state-owned commercial banks and insurance companies, they are generally less incentivized to hold green assets. We observed a general trend of higher yields in onshore green bond market against a broad bond market in the past five years, except in 2022. The overall credit market volatility in 2022 has led to worsening credit profiles among the onshore debt borrowers and higher yields compared to the green bonds. Globally, as well as in China, you know, one important consideration for investor demand for green bonds is the quality of those green bonds, which, of course, means, you know, is the capital that's being raised through these bonds, is it actually going towards 
eligible green projects. In the context of China, what's, you know, what's being done to address these concerns and perhaps other potential concerns that investors may have? Well, we have observed a noticeable improvement in terms of our allocating the bond proceeds to the green projects in the past 12 months. Uh, so one of the biggest drivers coming from the regulation, the securities regulator, so China Securities uh, Regulatory Commission, the CSRC, and the People's Bank of China, PBOC, published a new green bond principles in July 2022. This is to set a stricter standards that requires 100% of the bond proceeds to be used on the eligible green projects. So our research found that nearly all new green bonds issued after July 2022 that are regulated by CSRC and PBOC are now able to meet 100% green user proceeds requirement by aligning with the domestic and international green taxonomies. So corporate bonds, financial bonds, medium-term notes, and short-term financing bonds are, are the ones that are falling under this category. But one thing I think is very important to note, also very unique to the China market, is that uh, the domestic bond market is fragmented with various regulators overseeing different segments of the market. So the CSRC, that's its only regulator so far that has imposed the 100% green UOP requirement, and that applies to the corporate and financial bonds. But the enterprise bonds that are under um, the supervision of the National Development and the Reform Commission, the NDRC, the bonds are very actively issued by the local government financing vehicles, are still allowing up to 50% of the proceeds to be used for the non-green activities, such as just to repaying the bank loans or just for the working capital. The discrepancies have led to a diverging quality among the onshore bonds as an effort to fund the eligible green activities. Um, regulatory financial market reforms that announced by the Chinese central government in March 2023 may also help to reduce the regulatory gap across the onshore green bond market. Under this new framework, the CSRC will retain its oversight over the security sector while taking over responsibilities of approving enterprise bond issuances from the NDRC. This organizational restructuring may improve the quality of green enterprise bonds as we will soon face the same 100% green requirements as the corporate and financial bonds. In general, we think China is making progress in aligning with international green bond standards as it further opens domestic capital markets. But at the same time, the ESG awareness among domestic private investors are building up and interests in China's onshore green bond space from the foreign investor will also further drive up the price of onshore green bonds. So hopefully soon in the future, we'll be able to see some of the greenium effect more obviously in China's onshore green bond market. Great. Thanks so much for that overview on China's green bond market development. Certainly a rapidly evolving segment of China's capital markets and very interesting to keep an eye on that going forward. I want to turn to another area of very interesting area from your report, and that is global carbon markets and their impact on China's domestic carbon market. So the European Union just passed and adopted the carbon border adjustment mechanism in in 2023. Uh, How do you see the impact of this uh, policy on Chinese manufacturing companies uh, that have exposures to certain commodities? And what does this mean for China's domestic policy and its own national emissions trading scheme? Absolutely. Sustainable Fitch uh, recently published a report discussing the potential impact of EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism, CBAM, Asian exporters. So the CBAM has officially kicked off just in this month, uh, which is October of 2023. And this is, is a first carbon border tariff within the world that is trying to adopt a form of a carbon tax to address a carbon leakage issue. Um, Initially, this CBAM will cover some of the most carbon-intensive imported commodities, um, including iron and steel, cement, aluminum, fertilizer, electricity, hydrogen, and some of the downstream products. China is one of the top exporters to EU and mostly on iron, steel, and aluminum. So we're expecting the CBAM is going to have an initial impact, but limited on the price of the Chinese exported goods because the scheme currently only covers a small range of exported goods to Europe. We have mentioned um, that's iron, steel, and aluminum. However, we believe the potential impact of CBAM on Chinese exported goods will increase 
as the sector coverage um, expands and the carbon prices traded from the EU ETS will also increase in the future. So the EU is planning to include more carbon intensive midstream and the downstream products into CBAM in the future. And some other countries such as Canada and the UK are also considering or already planning to incorporate such similar carbon border tariffs um, within its domestic climate and trade policies. This year, we're already seeing that the carbon prices from EU ETS is already increased higher than 100 euro per ton for the first time, which is a very significant improvement. And I'm also expecting to see um, this price continue rising as the amount of uh, free allowances will be phased out soon um, from the EU ETS. Um, so domestic carbon pricing scheme within APAC countries have a very important role to incentivize companies to adopt a clean technologies to reduce the carbon intensity of the manufacturing production. So the price of the carbon emission allowances currently that are traded on China's national carbon markets has been stagnating for quite some time, uh, which is around 56 to around 60 Chinese yuan per ton. And that's around like a US dollar per ton in the past two years. And this is mainly due to a small number of participating companies from the power sector and also a large amount of free allowances have been provided to these companies. And it's not until recently there has been a bump in the price from these carbon prices traded under the national carbon market as more of the companies are now facing growing compliance pressure by the end of this 2023. Uh, in general, we believe the CBAM is going to pressure uh, national ETS to accelerate the sector expansion and improve their trading activities, which eventually will drive up domestic carbon prices. And it's also one of the most important objectives from the Chinese policymaker in the near term, and that is to expand the sector coverage uh, from currently only for the power sector to include more sectors such as cement and steel. Even though the carbon prices as a national market right now is still currently much lower than the prices from the EU ETS, but we're still expecting to see that it can help to companies to lower the carbon tariff costs on the major exported goods to foreign countries um, in the future. Are there any other significant updates to share uh, regarding China's national carbon markets? Um, one thing, as we just mentioned, is the sector expansion of the national ETS. I think we also have to acknowledge that the national ETS is um, in China is still at a very early stage of development compared to EU, which has been in the process for more than a decade. And this requires a lot of trial and errors at the beginning in terms of building the market infrastructure while balancing the priority for economic development, energy security, and decarbonization. What we have seen so far is that the environmental regulator, the Ministry of Ecology and Environment, have loosened the carbon intensity benchmarks slightly for the conventional coal power plants in the emission allocation plans for this year. Um, so this is compared to the earlier consultation draft. So this may actually indicating a policy consideration to alleviate power companies of co compliance burden in the near term due to the lower energy demand during the pandemic, the recent rapidly um, expanding coal power plant as a concern over the power shortage. Another key topic to watch, I think, this year for the China's national carbon markets is a relaunch of the domestic voluntary carbon market, um, China's Carbon Emission Reduction, CCER, and it, it has been widely expected to resume operations by 2023. The registration and approval for CCER projects have been suspended by the NDRC since the 2017. Oversupply and the lower eligibility of the carbon offset projects have led to the lower trading prices, and that undermine the benefits of having such a market mechanism. The national ETS currently allow up to 5% of the verified emission to be offsized through CCER. Offsides mostly can come from three main sources, including renewables, carbon sinks such as forestry, and the utilization of missing. There has been some recent news um, saying that the government has approved a list of the new CCER methodologies that have already met the stricter criteria and standards. So we'll also have to wait to see what are these methodologies and how they will reflect the additionality for carbon offsetting. Hopefully that will also help to solve the issues around the lower project quality for offset and low carbon trading prices, which has been seen previously in before 2017.
Um, the demand for CCER projects we're expecting were mostly coming from this the entities in the carbon intensive industries uh, where the carbon abatement is costly or hard to achieve. The sector expansion and the tightening emission intensity mar uh, benchmarks for the national ETS over time will also drive up the demand for the carbon offside. We have also observed a rising price index for CCER recently, which uh, is largely driven by the reduced amount of free allowances and the tightening carbon intensity benchmarks for the second compliance period. And we're expecting this trend to continue as the number of Chinese corporates that have made uh, net zero pledges will continue to increase. And uh, the expectation of future higher carbon allowance um, prices in the compliance market will also increase the demand for the carbon offside projects. Thank you uh, for all your insights today, Jingwei. I found this conversation to be incredibly interesting. And certainly the evolution of China's green bond market will be an important part of the ongoing development of its onshore capital markets and will play, of course, a critical role in helping China to achieve some of its environmental and emissions targets uh, over the longer run. Uh, so this is an area, of course, to monitor closely, and I hope that our listeners will keep an eye out for your subsequent China ESG snapshot reports, as they are very interesting and a very worthwhile read. You've been listening to Fitch Ratings China Perspectives podcast. To learn more about our ratings and research on China, visit us at FitchRatings.com. And please subscribe to China Perspectives on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Take care until next time.